On October 6, 2018, my day started as normal, as a normal Saturday. However, we were heading to a wedding for the afternoon. The day was going to be exciting, fun, relaxing, a celebration of life and new beginnings. There's one thing that stands out about the morning, and it's simple and small, and very important to me. I'm a college professor, and I have promised and I had promised one of my students some materials so that she could complete an independent study course that we had developed together. It was a month into the fall 2018 semester that day, and I couldn't find the materials I had promised. I felt responsible for her progress and achievement. And that morning, on October 6th, while searching through the storage in my garage, I found the materials she needed. I felt great relief. I even texted her a picture and exclamation. Great. That was taken care of. Now it was time to party. The day started out on such a high note, yet ended in absolute tragedy for so many people, all because of what appears to be systematic indifference or negligence. Flash forward over four and a half years later, on the afternoon of May 11, 2023, I testified during the trial of what I observed sitting in the driver's seat of our family's vehicle, window down, waiting responsibly at the edge of the road to turn left onto Route 38 and facing up the hill of Route 30. I watched as the limo came speeding down the hill, raced through the intersection, and sped past only feet away from me and my family crashing into my sister-in-law's vehicle, crushing her vehicle in an instant. The instantaneous crushing sound will never leave my memory. I can still hear that to, to this day. I saw the explosive impact that followed in the ravine. I will not describe what I saw here, saw again here, but it was horrific and will never leave me. I lost my father-in-law and my brother-in-law in an instant. I nearly lost my sister-in-law and still did not understand how she survived because everything narrowly missed her by inches. I am haunted by that day. To this day, I am haunted <coughs> by large white and SUVs driving past me, especially if they come too close to the center line or drive by too fast, or even tell. I am haunted by the media that callously show the images of October 6, 2018, without warning. Now I seldom watch the news. It's full of too much damage and loss. I am haunted by the sounds of crushing vehicles, minor accidents, or fender benders nearby, send me back to that moment. And for the record, I'm haunted by the fact that had I decided to eat a sandwich ordered to go from the apple barrel while standing in the parking lot of the apple barrel, or that if my sister-in-law hadn't helped get my three-year-old son, who was not cooperating at the time, to get him into his car seat, the things could have been even worse. It may not be rational, but I am haunted by the visions of what could have happened if we hesitated another minute. If we had delayed by another minute, my pregnant wife, my son, and my family members, even our dog probably, would not be here today. And I see these images as dreams and as flashbacks. I see these scenarios. I'm pinned and crushed under our vehicle and unable to help aware that everyone else, including my family, is dead. Sometimes I am killed in these images, too. <coughs> and then my dream ends abruptly in darkness. These are not rational thoughts. I had a unique look into the hell that unfolded, or exploded that day. As far as I am aware, I am the only relative that was present that day that had a particular slice or view of the entire uh, crash and uh, of the entire crash and witnessed 
the moment and aftermath that killed my father-in-law and brother-in-law. I saw that. They were my family, my friends, and I loved them. We three were the men that married strong, intelligent, wonderful women. It was something we shared. While many others witnessed the loss of 20 people, I witnessed the thing that caused my wife and son so much pain. I saw the thing that caused so much heartbreak and that changed everything for my mother-in-law and my in-laws. And for many years, I've had a hard time visiting my in-laws due to their feeling terrible for seeing the thing that hurt them so bad. And since the beginning, I've avoided special meetings with the other amazing and wonderful families impacted by this tragedy because I witnessed the thing that hurt them. As if I am somehow responsible for it. Or carry with me something evil for which they might judge me for witnessing what happened to their loved ones. It's not rational, but it's real, and it impacts me to this day. Everything that I have felt, the loss, the grief, and the trauma I experienced is nothing compared to what my wife has gone through. She is beautiful, amazing, uh, absolutely amazing, and strong. My wife did not watch the limo pass by our vehicle. She kept her eyes locked forward. But after she ran out of our vehicle, she had, after she ran out of her vehicle, she had her own experience with this hell and saw a different view as she ran up to the limo desperately searching for her father, Jim Schnurr, and for our brother-in-law, Brian Huff. I can't imagine losing my father and seeing what she saw and experienced that day. She is stronger than I am. My son lost his grandfather. They absolutely love each other. I have pictures that undeniably show this is true. To this day, my son talks about his grandfather, gets sad, cries, and looks at those pictures to keep the memories alive. He does not get to have his grandfather or uncle in his life. My daughter was unborn. She will, not ha only, she will only have pictures and never know how awesome and loving her grandfather was. I can't even imagine how amazing it would be to watch Jim But it is something she is denied and never will get to experience. I invoke these moments because what I saw and experienced that day will never leave us. My pregnant wife, son, and I were present and witnessed different parts of this hell. Our lives are forever changed. One of the family members impacted by this crash invoked the cost of maintaining the limit, a $2,000 break charge. That includes parts and labor. Brakes are a no-brainer. They're one of the most critical systems to maintain on any given vehicle. Now, ironically, they're actually pretty easy to maintain, too. Friction and heat absorb kinetic energy and stop vehicles. It's easy to drive forward. It's absolutely necessary to be able to stop. My father, my father taught me how to check and maintain my vehicles, change my oil, and maintain the brakes of my cars, and to be responsible. Along the same vein of accounting, I wish to point out that it's taken just over four and a half years to get to this point. In total, four and a half years and 20 people. That's 90 years of lives lost so far because of extreme negligence and indifference. 90 years of lost lives and untold, unknown number, and untold, uh, an untold, unknown number of years impacted for everyone else impacted by this tragedy. I wish to express my deepest sympathies for all of the families, especially all of the children. Thank you, Your Honor. I am thankful for this moment to write and speak for my family to share for the record, ever so briefly, just scratching the surface really, of what we lost and 
how we continue to be impacted by this never-ending tragedy. Also, I am thankful that I did not have to decide the fate of the defendant, because this was never, ever anything that I wanted to be responsible for, not anything that I wished to do. My name is Donna Reilenberg. My daughter is Amanda. Four years, seven months, and 25 days ago, my wife, along with my families and dozens of others, was destroyed because you and Mavis chose to put profit over people and allowed Amanda and 16 of her friends to get into a vehicle that was made unsafe by your and Mavis's lengthy pattern of disregard for maintenance and safety. The end result of your and Mavis's actions was the senseless death of 20 people. Amanda was only 29 years old and my only child. She had a whole life ahead of her. She had a great career that she loved, and they loved her. She was the voice for people that didn't have a voice. She was well respected by everyone. You have taken everything from her father and I. I will never see her father walk her down the aisle and watch her marry the man she fell in love with. I see the look in her eyes when she held her child for the first time, I will never hear the word grandma or I love you from my grandchild. I cry every day. My heart is shattered. I miss her beautiful sparkling eyes, her bright smile and her infectious laugh. I miss her every second of every day. I shouldn't only have pictures and memories of her, I should have her here with us. What should have been a birthday celebration ended up being a nightmare. They did the right thing, not drinking and driving, but you had no regard for their lives or your driver's life. Now this is something you have to live with for the rest of your life, knowing your actions caused the death of 20 people. The night that I received that phone call, is forever burned into my brain. I relive it over and over again. I kept saying it's not her. In the hours waiting, and no one able to tell us anything, just made it even worse. The days following after the New York State Police showed up to confirm her death, I was like a zombie. I didn't sleep or eat, and I still don't sleep or eat right. I have to find my new normal, and I don't know if that will ever happen. <laughs> there are no winners in this, because I will never have Amanda back, and now you will live with the pain I live with every day. I am thankful that the jury has found you guilty, that you now have to own your actions and your role in this tragedy, and I pray that this court passes the maximum sentence against you so that you will have sufficient time to contemplate what you have taken from my family and the families of the other 19 victims. Thank you. My name is Mary Ashton. My son is Michael Christopher Bukai, who served as a United States Marine. From the time he was 16 years old, Michael wanted to be a Marine. I remember him saying over and over. I want to be a Marine. I want to be a Marine. At the age of just under 18, Michael got his wish and joined the U.S. Marine Corps. Unfortunately, when Michael came back from Iraq, he had suffered terrible PTSD. Michael was just beginning to put his life back together. He was dealing with the PTSD doing what he could do to move forward in his life. He began renovating his house that he had inherited from his grandparents and was very excited about all of the plans he had. Michael was 
results were a huge gamer. His basement was being excavated at the time of his death. Michael wanted to use the new basement to make a game room for all of his pinball machines so he and his friends, some of which were killed with him, they could gather together and have fun. Sorry. Michael was really just starting to live again when his life was so selfishly snatched from him. While in Iraq, Michael's base came under incredible mortar attack on October 6, 2005. Things were very chaotic and life-threatening. Michael said he was under a table, undercover, thinking, oh my God, I'm going to die on my 21st birthday. He survived all of those things to come back stateside, to be killed on his way to a birthday party because Nama Hussein didn't care enough to properly ensure the safety of his clientele. On top of all that, I recently found out that Michael, while in Iraq, saved two other Marines' lives. I received a message from a Nick Vasquez stating how one day they came under mortar attack. The scene was described as crazy, hectic. Vasquez told me how Ukai came over to him and another Marine, Andre Singleton, to be sure they were okay. I was told Ukai was calm, cool, and then Ukai led them to safety. I was told by Vasquez that he and Singleton would not be here today if it were not for my son, Sergeant Michael Ukai. He told of my son's bravery and how he and Singleton considered my son a hero. <laughs> And here are just a couple of comments Vasquez made in reference to Michael. Nick, your son is a hero, and he deserves to be remembered as such. If he wouldn't have come through that night, I wouldn't be here today. He deserves nothing more than to be thought of as a man, hero, and warrior. He was always so funny and full of life. And without him, Andre and myself would not be here today. Now my son, who is a hero, will never be acknowledged. His life was selfishly taken too soon. He was just beginning to learn to live again. My eldest surviving son, Jeremy Ashton, a former Marine, is still having an extremely difficult time dealing with the loss of his brother, whom he was very, very close. Jeremy stated with extreme emotion in his voice, he, Hussein, took away the only contemporary positive influence in my life. Almost five years after the incident, I am still in counseling for anger management, as well as having to take medication to keep the anger at bay. This anger came from my son's life being taken so needlessly. I am now estranged from my daughter. I have not spoken to or heard from her since Michael's death. In a very real sense, I feel that I lost two children that fateful day in October 2018. With Michael now gone, we have no chance of experiencing, experiencing the joy of him having a family and of us having grandchildren from him. Any and every dream that Michael had has been shattered. My heart aches from the loss of my son. He should still be here with us today. And there is nothing that can fill the void that has been left inside of myself, my husband, and our family. We ask that Hussein receive the maximum punishment even with a lengthy sentence, it will never sustain the loss that we have had to endure and continue to endure through the loss of our boy. Our lives have been irreparably altered. My name is Sheila McGarvey. I'm the mother of Shane Thomas McGowan and the mother-in-law of Erin Bertucci McGowan. I would like the court to know the 17 young people killed inside the crash on October 6, 2018, were all the best this world has to give. Many of them met either in school or through work. 
They were not the kind of people who operated on the fringes of the law or had a total disregard for the law, but rather lived their lives to the fullest as law-abiding citizens of our great country and enjoyed the freedoms it had to offer. They lived lives that mattered, lives of love. I was taught by my parents, Kevin and Bridget McGarvey, who immigrated from Northern Ireland to escape economic and religious oppression and discrimination, to have the utmost respect for the law, government, and for those that lead us. Though my mother was a naturalized citizen, my dad became a proud citizen as soon as he was able, as, so he too could participate in the great American democratic process. Part of the impact this tragedy has had on me and my family is the erosion of trust and lack of confidence in the great American institution, the FBI, as well as the two departments of New York State, Department of Transportation and the Department of Motor Vehicles. I remember reading about the criminal Shahzad Hussein in the years after 9-11 and his role as an FBI informant. The FBI and their attempt to keep the masses fooled and thinking we were safe from terrorists engaged this criminal Shahzad Hussein. Hussad was arrested related to DMV scam, whereby he assisted DMV test cheaters for a fee of three to five hundred dollars. Rather than face criminal charges and deportation, this criminal became an FBI informant. It is a tangled web of lies, deceit, including questionable real estate transactions, bankruptcy filings, fraud that this criminal was involved in and the FBI, FBI was either active participant or had knowledge of. Whenever this criminal brushed up against a bill collector of the law, he pulled the card of being an FBI informant. It has been reported that one of the reasons that Shahzad Hussein has not been brought to justice is related to how the FBI ensnared black and immigrant men in order to concoct terrorism plots with the help of this criminal. Also, it has been reported and speculated that this criminal was off limits by the feds, and if the government went after him, he will simply say, all right, I will tell everyone how we knew these guys weren't terrorists and the FBI screwed them anyway. On June 29, 2011, a U.S. District Judge noted after sentencing a man as a result of one of the Hussein FBI counterterrorism plots, and I quote, the FBI played a key role. It created acts of terrorism out of his fantasies of bravado and bigotry and made those fantasies come true. Again, it has been reported that the FBI got in bed with the devil. I despise the FBI agents that got into bed with this criminal one of which is now running for public office in Saratoga Springs. To this day, neither the FBI, Department of Transportation, or New York State government will answer how, why, and by whom did a significant number of fines for breaking major safety rules magically disappeared. I have no faith in the FBI, their agents, or the New York State to do the right thing. I do ask why Governor Cuomo and the Department of Transportation failed to convene a task force after the 2015 limo crash in Long Island that killed four young women, and they failed to address the grand jury's recommendations for limo safety. I tried to wrap my head around how our lives got entangled with this criminal and his family. I guess it is because the FBI, Department of Transportation, and Motor Vehicles allowed the limo service to be operational. The limo was knowing, knowingly and intentionally with a total disregard for safety registered as a passenger vehicle and not a commercial vehicle as it should have been. Department of Motor Vehicles has still not been held accountable for this. Perhaps there's still a connection with the criminal father and the DMV. Naturally, the FBI denies any knowledge of the illegal limo operations, but acknowledges that they received a call from both Shassad and Naaman 
immediately after the crash. I guess we're all just a bunch of simple folk in our jeans and sweatshirts. Naman, or shall we call you Shasad or Sean? You have some nerve going by the name Sean. It has been reported you too like personating others in your family. How many times were you given the opportunity to do the right thing and have the limo properly registered and inspected by the Department of Transportation? Once, twice, a dozen times, I guess this was a trait you learned from your criminal father. And as we have learned, you had the audacity to list this death trap on Craigslist as DOT ready. You failed to drug test your drivers as required by law. Another missed opportunity on your part to do the right thing. And in fact, the driver of the limo on October 6, 2018 was ordered off the road just a month before the crash for not having the proper license to drive a limo and still not, did not have the right license on the morning of October 6, 2018. So when you got the call for a last minute limo for, from Axel Steinberg, you intentionally removed the out of service sticker on the limo for whatever reason that sticker was on there and called the improperly licensed driver with a questionable safety record. You took advantage of people looking for a replacement vehicle the last minute and the opportunity to make hundreds of dollars illegally. Too bad they didn't have the opportunity to read the negative reviews about your death trap, the poor state of disrepair, and the filth of your vehicle. My son Shane didn't even have a seat in your death trap and was sitting on a barrel or some sort of makeshift seat if it was not unlawful to remove the sticker and you had confidence the limo was safe to operate, why didn't you drive the limo that day? You were perhaps equally unqualified to drive the limo as the non-drug tested driver you placed behind it, who we later learned had a significant amount of THC in his blood at the time of the crash. In the days prior to October 6, Shane had asked me and reminded me several times if I would pick him up, pick him and Aaron up, drop them off at Amy and Axel's house around 1245 on October 6, and then pick them back up later in the afternoon that evening. Shane didn't want to drive after partying for the day and didn't want to spend the money on an Uber. Shane and I often talked on the phone each day, including when we both were driving home from work, Shane from Saratoga and me from Albany. Friday, October 5th was no different than any other, but Shane was excited. He had just received news. He and Erin were pre-qualified for a loan and were hoping to buy the first home before they had a baby. As promised, I picked Shane and Erin up around 1245. Shane got out of the car first while we waited for Erin, got in the car first while we waited for Erin. I noticed Shane didn't smell of cigarettes, but rather a nice cologne. I didn't want to upset between seven and eight was, What's the plan, Shane? Not knowing they were killed about an hour after I last saw them. Aaron's friend Melissa called me crying, tell me Shane and Aaron had been in a bad limo accident in Schoharie and it wasn't good. I remember saying they weren't in a limo. Shane had told me that a bus had been scheduled to take the group to Cooperstown, not Schoharie. I was thinking, even if it was an accident, how bad could it be? Minutes later, after hearing the news on TV and not hearing from Shane, I called the state troopers. And within 15 minutes, they were at my door. Terry looked at me and said, this isn't good. That's when my nightmare started. I had to call Shane's dad, Randy McGowan, and Colin, who was at an Eric Clapton concert. I remember hearing the roar of the crowd in the background as Clapton was taking the stage. And Colin's cry when I told him, I demanded to see my son's body at the funeral. Prior to his body being cremated, he was placed in a makeshift coffin. Seeing my child wearing a hospital gown and his head wrapped due to severe lacerations across his scalp and forehead and touching his cold, lifeless body, I realized this brutal, senseless tragedy was the result of a selfish act by one man and one man only, and he must be held accountable for his actions. An act of free will, you, Naaman, knowingly and willingly 
put that limo on the road on October 6, resulting in 20 deaths. While driving with Shane about a year prior to the accident, he told me I was speeding past Fulton Montgomery College. I said school was not in session, but Shane reminded me that speed limit was still in effect regardless. Forever following this preventable tragedy, I can hear Shane yelling and calling out to the driver to stop or pull over. This keeps me awake and angry most nights. I could tell you again about my son Shane, how much he was loved by his family and friends, all the joy he brought to us, watching him grow, play, learn, graduating from college, excelling at his job, and marrying beautiful Erin Bertucci. We had just celebrated Erin and Shane's wedding on June 8, 2018, just four months before you, Nauman, killed them. In July of 2018, my family and six of my seven brothers and our families made our annual vacation to Cape May, New Jersey. Shane and Aaron were talking about and joking about names they would give their children. Shane made me smile because he said he really liked the name Brogan if he had a son, as it was my granny in Ireland's maiden name. He got, never got the opportunity to have or name a child. Why? Because you killed him. The loss of Shane and Aaron, all the victims of this preventable, preventable tragedy, continues to be felt by so many and leaves the world a darker place. Every day, I again try to wrap my head around this impossible situation and come to terms that Shane and Aaron are gone. I never get, will get to see him again, hear his voice, or a voicemail saying, Hi, Mom, it's me, Shane, as if I didn't know the voice of my own child. The pain, grief, and despair and depression that comes and stays is overwhelming at times. I grieve for what we had and all the important things that they have missed and will continue to miss. They never got to buy that house, celebrate the first Christmas together as a married couple, anniversary, or any other first, or experience the joy of bringing a new life into this world. When Aaron's when Lynn, Aaron's mom, and I were imprinting Shane and Aaron's shoes in the cement at the memorial, we cried knowing we should have been celebrating a baby shower or the birth of the first grandchild. Grief is all the love I want to give Shane and Aaron, but this love has no place to go. Initially, the worst time of the day was in the car while driving home. I continue to hate every day without him. I curse the nightmare of not knowing if I'll have another sleepless night filled with memories, loss and pain and horror they must have felt knowing that they were flying through the air and about to be killed. I want to call Shane and tell him about all the blessings in our lives, how, it, how his uncle Sean is doing well, about his cousins, Ashley got engaged, Maggie graduated from law school in England, Kevin got several offers to law schools including some full tuition, paid offers, and most importantly, how well his brothers Colin and Aaron are doing. But I can't tell Shane any of this. I said it twice before, if only you were a decent law-abiding businessman and paid a fraction of the money you pay your hired, hired guards, and, and none of us knew what that was about, or your attorneys on the proper operation and maintenance of your limo. 20 people would more than likely would be living their lives today. You didn't care then, and you don't care now about any of this, but this time it's different than the other two previous court proceedings. This time you were convicted of 20 counts of manslaughter, and you are in jail. I do hope you serve considerable time. Your so-called community service was a joke, and I don't care who this offends, but if and when you're allowed conjugal visits, I hope you see the faces of the 20 people you killed who no longer can love or be loved. We hold our memories close to our hearts, but you can't love a memory, wrap your arms around it, and say I love you. I certainly don't want to see a life wasted, but I do, don't believe you feel remorse in any way or in any way feel responsible for your acts and the manslaughter of 20 innocent lives. There are no true winners here. Although Shane was a grown man of 30 years old, when you killed him, he was and will always be my baby boy, my first brown-eyed handsome boy.
Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me start by thanking the court and the jurors for their verdict of manslaughter in the second degree. We'd also like to thank the Schoharie community for opening their hearts to our families over this nightmare. This trial, which was a long time in coming, was an incredibly difficult journey for the Limbo families. We're now affectionately known as Limbo families, which is fine. This journey actually started years ago before the accident. It started when the FBI empowered Shahad Hussein to be an informant, a two-bit informant at that. In doing so, the Hussein family seemed to believe they were now above the law. To them, federal and New York State laws and regulations were simply suggestions that they made a habit to ignore. They ignored these laws as their greed took precedence over all else. Shahad fought Newman well as he was put in charge of a ramshackle motel and a limousine business, such as it was. The motel racked up numerous New York State Department of Health violations, which were mostly ignored. And the motel, excuse me, and which were ignored and a limousine business that offered poorly maintained vehicles for hire. Limousines often taken out of service for safety violations. Hussein's greed, which we've heard multiple times today, wouldn't allow him to spend the money necessary to make his limousines safe, to legally register them, available for hire. He ignored dozens of violations that stated he was required to have DOT authority and that DOT authority would have required semi-annual DOT inspections of the doomed limousine. Those inspections would have either required repair of the limousines or taking that death trap limousine off the road. It's greed, simply greed. It makes me and my family sick to know that a $2,000 brake repair would have avoided this catastrophe. We lost 20 wonderful human beings. Please remember every day when you're in that prisoner, prison and you're looking in the mirror, knowing that you're there, it's self-afflicted. You wouldn't be willing, you wouldn't, aren't willing to spend $2,000 to repair that vehicle. Naman, you're a sorry excuse for a human being. There's one thing Naman can definitely count on in prison. The limo families look forward to visiting you wherever you might be in prison. And by that I mean we won't miss a single parole hearing wherever that hearing may take place. Our goal is to make sure you fulfill your entire prescribed prison sentence. Patrick, our son, brother. In closing, Patrick will not be remembered as a victim. He's much more than that label. He loved adventure, travel, socializing with friends far and near, He'll be remembered as a kind, thoughtful young man, a wonderful son, brother, friend, teammate, a treasured employee of New York State, and a good, decent human being. Condolences for his loss came from literally all over the world, and his memory will be carried forward by all those that loved him and always will. May we and us all aspire to be a little bit more like Patrick Kevin Cushion. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. My name is Sam Bersessi, father of Savannah Bersessi, the youngest victim at 24 years that was killed by Nami Hussein. I'm supposed to tell you how this loss has affected me, but before I do that, let me tell you about an event in 1977. My wife's brother, Jerry, was killed in a head-on crash by a Table Talk Pie delivery truck that had a front tire blowout. And yes, the tires were bald. Her brother and two other men were burnt to death in that crash. He was 24 years old. And Jerry 
my wife was 16 years old at the time. I had this curious interest of what it was like for her as a sibling and more importantly her parents and not even knowing that some 41 years later it would happen to our family. We, had, we often had discussions about what their lives were like after his death and I remember Jerry always saying to me, quote, it's something you never get over, you just learn to live with it. How strange that I met someone that experienced a similar event at the same age and now Jerry is the one who is helping me live with it. And she is able to help me understand what our remaining two daughters are experiencing which is hard as a parent to understand that. How it has affected me, I really have no words. day and time and it happens every Saturday. Before October 6, 2018, the name Nam and Hussein never entered my life. However, four and a half years later, I feel I know so much about his personality. His greed, his selfishness, his narcissism, and his lawlessness. There is so much more truth about Nam and Hussein's past transgressions that were never allowed at this trial. The limo crash was not created in a vacuum. Nam and Hussein was playing with fire long before he killed 20 people. He could have stopped this crash so many times if he only cared about someone other than himself. He is by no means the underdog as someone would have you believe. I'm asking the court to impose the maximum sentence without parole. Even then, he's getting off pretty easy for killing 20 people. I would like to thank you, Your Honor, for your role in bringing justice to this case. You saw through the horrific injustice of the plea agreement and you acted. You stand among a few. I would also like to acknowledge the state police in their role in bringing this to trial and also part of the state police that most of us never interact with and hope we never do is the crime victim unit. They were our liaison to everything for the last four and a half years. We, we wouldn't know nothing if it wasn't for them. They were our go-between and they're a part of the state police that most of us don't even know exist. And they're just fantastic. So I just want to acknowledge them. That's all. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honor. And again, thank you for allowing us this time to be here. I write public correspondences for a living. I do public speaking for the state governor. Never would I have imagined that I would be writing the obituaries for my four sisters-in-law. Never would I have imagined that I would also be writing a victim impact statement on their behalf for the second time within four and a half years. October 6, 2018 is a date forever burned into my heart and soul. I woke up to spend the day with my babies and then an evening with my best friends. My sisters celebrating our baby sister's upcoming big 30th birthday with my brother-in-laws and other lifelong friends. We were ready to celebrate all the accomplishments Amy had made within her almost 30 years of life. Little did we know we would never celebrate her 30 years of life. They wouldn't even make it to the brewery to celebrate at all. Those years were selfishly ripped away. 
That morning, my phone text messages were going off like crazy, per usual. We were all in a group message that we were continuously texting in every day. That morning, the messages were off about who was wearing what, who needed to borrow this and that, where and what time for sure we were meeting up after the brewery, and who still had each other's crap that needed to be returned. We were supposed to be going to dinner afterwards. Sitting on the living room floor playing with my daughter, I hear and watch the LifeNet helicopter take off over our house off of 30A, not knowing that that very helicopter was on its way to try and rescue someone from the death trap on wheels that had just crashed into an embankment. I can no longer hear that helicopter without having cold sweat. I can no longer breathe when I hear the humming of the rescue team. There's a great pain that consumes my chest and stops me in my tracks when I hear one. Linda, my mother-in-law, the most amazing person, texted me a screenshot of scary county news on Facebook about a wedding party that had crashed into the apple barrel. As horrible as this sounds and selfish on my part, I wish more than anything that it was a wedding party and not my family. My intuition was telling me more, though. I immediately began texting my family, begging that they text us to let us know that all is well. I continued to tell myself and my mother-in-law that they were stuck on I-88 with no service, and that is why no one was responding. I began to call the sheriff's office in Apple Barrel, just looking for any information. It wasn't until Linda called me, crying, asked me to come over as the accident was all of them, and they were all gone. If you're wondering what it's like to hold a grieving mother as she just learned that four of her beautiful, humble, and caring daughters were killed, or if you're wondering what it's like to hold your desperately broken spouse as he crumbles, would defeat after his baby sisters were brutally killed. Or if you're wondering what it's like to tell your own babies that their beloved aunts and uncles are gone. Or if you're wondering what it's like to try and explain to your niece why we can't FaceTime mommy and daddy in heaven. While also explaining that they didn't want to leave. Well, I can tell you what it's like. And it's a living hell. It was pure torture and it is every single day. My sister-in-laws were good people. The best of the best. They cared for others out of the goodness of their hearts. They valued and cherished all of their family and friends. They had children that they were raising and unconditionally loved. You stole them from us and you robbed their children of ever having a life with them. My brothers-in-law were my protectors. They watched out for all of us. They joked and poked fun as any other brother in my foot. But any time I called for anything, at any time, they were there. I've endured great depression and anxiety from all of this. Grief is something that I will forever live with. It's the worst pain to feel within your soul. I can no longer travel or leave my house for extended periods in fear that I may never return. I live in this constant mentality that if anything could happen, even with the slightest possibility of it happening, then it will, and it alters my life. How will my, channel, my children handle their life if they have to live as orphans like my nieces and nephew? How will my family live on if I too were to ever be ripped away? Our holidays and celebrations have a gaping hole in them now. We are all waiting for the door to open and for our family to walk in and be with us. At dinner time, my in-laws still make way too much food. We still have enough food to feed anyone that may walk in. There's less laughter throughout the homes. There's more sadness than any family should ever feel. I miss my sisters. I miss my group chat going off daily. At times I still hear the faint sound 
of the special ringer I had set on it. But I know it's just my heart wanting to hear it because they're gone. Your greed took them from us. That group chat will never happen again. I miss having someone to call whenever I needed something. I miss having someone to walk with me or just to run to the grocery store with. I miss the days when one of them would just walk in my front door because they knew they could and often did. There wasn't a weekend that our plans didn't involve one another. And now the only plan I will ever have in any of them again is to visit their gravestone. There are days and nights that I feel completely alone and emptiness. I don't have my support. I don't have my comfort. I don't have that love I desperately need and the only love they could give. I miss being their support. I miss their calls when they needed advice or wanted to cheer about an accomplishment. I miss being a big sister. I miss their calls and texts to check in on their children. I've had to plan events and holidays without them. They would have loved to have been there and a part of it all. They should have been. There's so much they should have been a part of. Children now will grow up with no parents. They will not get to enjoy the moments in life that they deserve to have together as a family. Parents should not have to build, bury their children, let alone four. You will never live a day with the pain we will live with forever. You will be able to hug and kiss your family and be there for them through it all, especially the last four and a half years. We will not, ever. Time behind bars will protect others and give us some peace and hopefully some time for you to learn the value of a life and how to respect other people. The scream of your girlfriend on the day your verdict was read will still be drowned out by the screams of my mother-in-law finding out her babies are gone. The screams I had to hear while telling my family the news is still so piercing and will always be louder. The tears that she sobs now will stop within 15 years maximum, while ours will sob on forever, every single day, and wait until the babies are old enough to ask questions and wonder why too. You have received a justified guilty verdict that is still only eight to 15 years while the rest of us here have received the life sentence. I would like to recognize the heroes of this whole tragedy. To the EMTs, the dispatchers, the first responders, and anyone else who arrived to help the victims. Thank you. Sincerely from the bottom of my heart, thank you. You are all a truly special soul and are handcrafted by God. I hope that life brings you all that you deserve. There's not a day that goes by that I do not think of you and thank you for everything you did and have ever done on any call. I will forever pray for you. And as mad as I am, I am going to include the defendant and his family in this. At this time, I pray. I pray for each of us, including the defendant, his family, both sets of attorneys, and the courts and the jurors. I pray that we all keep faith and hope. I pray that we all feel peace throughout the days. I pray that we find value in all that we do. I pray that comfort is placed upon us and strength is shared when we need it the most. I love you forever, Abby, Mary, Allie, and Amy, and may you forever shine as bright as you did here. Thank you.